What do we have here? Finger bang! Bang it good. This package has come from China. And what's in here is the follow-up to the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. Like a complete fool, we got this pre-ordered. What the heck is that? So it looks like we've got buttons and screwdrivers, but what we ordered was a handheld. I really hope we don't have to build it ourselves. We do get a micro SD with SanDisk 32 gig. Now let's check the box. This one's fairly minimalistic, with obvious nudges to Nintendo. With bananas, coins, mushrooms, and a chicken. That must be for me. We ordered the orange 3 gig version of the Retroid Pocket 3. This small piece of tape here seals the box shut, and this one seems fairly unusual. You'd be expecting a necklace or something. I don't know. To keep Daisy loyal, we need a golden calculator watch. The surrounding plastic protects the handheld, keeping it firmly in place. And this is what we get with it. A very skimpy English manual. Four pages of useless information. A USB-C cable. And it's purple inside. Yeah. It also comes with a screen protector. And behind that, the Retroid Pocket 3. First impressions, it lacks character and looks very plain. Very similar to a capsule from a Kinder Egg. For the size, it feels quite light. And we appreciate the dual analog stick design. Perfect for PlayStation 1 games that support it. A mic hole at the top left. And there's a noticeable absence of the start and select button on the front face. Let's have a look down the bottom. We have two speaker holes. As well as a micro SD slot. USB-C for data transfer and charging. And a small headphone jack. Yes, close it. On the left side, we have a volume rocker, up and down. On the other side, a home button. Along the top, we have four shoulder buttons, as well as power, micro HDMI, and start and select. They're at the top. That is crazy. On the back, we have a whole lot of nothing. We just have these lines and a cheese grater at the top. As we're not giving wet tissues to clean the screen, we'll have to do without. And here goes nothing. Even if she does look like a capsule from a Kindle egg, it's nice when a pretty girl brings protection. Go, 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 go. And not one speck of dust. The D-pad is smaller than expected. Slightly clicky with very short travel. Switch style analog sticks. And the buttons feel like multivitamin tablets. Short travel with a small tactile click. L1 and R1 are very clicky. And L2 and R2 feel like they're analog, but they're not. You pull it in, and then there's a small click at the end. This actually feels really nice in the hand, but as it's very thin, it's very difficult to get all of your fingers on the shoulder buttons at the same time. Another concern would be these buttons on the side. Accidentally pushing the volume rocker won't be much of an issue, but if you push the home button in mid-game, that uh, could be a problem. And having start and select on the top? That's just weird. The controls are surprisingly different to the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. That one had heavier buttons with a longer travel, and the D-pad was extremely squishy. The Pocket 3 seems to be much closer to the feel of the Nintendo Switch game controller. Light, but firm. And the analog stick is like this, just shorter. It's time for the size comparison. Today, we're gonna compare it to a banana. It's the same color as a banana, or three times the size of a Roy Bosch tea bag. If you're not a tea drinker, how about the size of some other handhelds? The screen is the same height, but much wider than the Pocket 2 Plus, but similar in size to the RG353P. It's much larger than the MiU Mini, and absolutely dwarfs the Game Gear Micro, and the tea bag, and the banana. A quick look at the specs. This one seems very similar to the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. Main differences are RAM and display. How long does it take to turn on? I'm always turned on. How do monkeys stay safe when they walk down the stairs? They hold onto the banana to... Why did the banana go to the doctors? Because he wasn't feeling well. Okay, you'll like this one. Why do girls love bananas? Because it reminds them of John Luke's Don. <laughs> Wow, that intro was purely amazing. For the first boot up, it takes 39 seconds. When it's all set up, it takes 29. Not the best by a long shot. We now need to set the language. There's plenty to choose from. Wi-Fi, 
time zone? Then choose if you want Google Play. As we are using Android and we want an easy way to update our software, we'll take it. You'll then have a list of recommended applications by Retroid. Many emulators and freeware for you to smash on. If you don't know what you're looking at, just select them all. Now we get to choose which launcher starts when we turn on our handheld. We have a choice between the one that looks like Android or the one that looks like Emulation Nation Station. And then we should be good to go. Hmm, or maybe not. The thing is, this system has a lot of setting up to do. The biggest hint for that, this unopened micro SD card. So let's stick it in. In the menu here, we can set up ROM folders on our SD card. We can then eject it and then use it in our PC to copy over files. We could also use the USB-C cable if we wished. Either way, we need to copy in files into these folders. Then once we have the games copied over, we can go back to our Retroid Pocket 3. We can now decide which systems are available on our menu. While there is a good selection, I think there's a lot missing. Let's take a look in one of these folders. All right, so let's try and find the ROMs. And then scan, then add, and let's try default SD card, and scan. Just press OK here. Wow, it's found them. We can continue with the other folders too. If it recognizes the file name, it'll give you the box art. And believe it or not, we've got more setting up to do. So down here, we're gonna to go to standalone setup and go through each of these options. We'll also go into RetroArch, update, and add all the cores we wanna use. And in the Retroid Pocket Game menu, we can push edit, then select from this dropdown which emulator is used. And finally, we can play. Setting the system up is a complete nightmare. If you want to do this yourself, we suggest you check out the guide by Retro Game Corps. You'll save a lot of time and energy by doing so. Before we hit game testing, here's Geekbench. These are very impressive scores from a cheap handheld, but the same cannot be said for the Vulcan score. It failed one of the tests, so this score got hit badly. Probably a software issue. Now it's time to test the games. First up, Early Arcade. As we're using RetroArch, we can change the options to rotate the screen 90 degrees. Controls also need to be remapped, so we can use this analog stick. Next section, Computer Systems. Amiga emulation runs very well, and even the intro to Jim Power gets around 38 frames per second. But when we're in the game, it is full speed. Even the demo Nine Fingers is 100% all the way through. DOS games are also running rather well. If you're using DOSBox for your handheld, write in a comment down below. It'd be nice to see what games are being played. For the next section, consoles and handhelds. If you like turn-based strategy games, this one is a beauty. As there are no DS emulators available at stock, we need to use Google Play to buy one. And finally we can say, you're a wizard, Harry. DS is running pretty well, unless you're trying to get the menu up.
I love it that you can change the colour of your car in this game. And them speech bubbles give it a lot of personality. On the surface, Unirally looks really dull. But I'll tell you now, it's a whole lot of fun. The N64 is a system that is awkward to emulate. Even games like GoldenEye ran quite poor on original N64 hardware, which makes it quite difficult to gauge how well it's actually playing. And here's God of War for the N64. One of them games that no one plays, but it's great for benchmarks. Something I'd never really expect on a handheld is the GameCube, and some games work surprisingly good. Zelda runs slow, but is somewhat playable. Unlike MGS2. And F-Zero GX, we can forget. We're going to move to a Wii game. If you notice, this game is running really well. So if you're wanting performance from a Wii or GameCube, it's probably best to stick with 2D graphics. Usually at stock, RetroArch is using the PCSX rearmed core. If your game feels sluggish, it's better to change to either Duck Station or Swan Station. That'll make the game feel nice and snappy. Moving on to the PlayStation 2, Capcom vs SNK2 is working great, but with dips when you pull out a super. And on this screen, Final Fantasy X looks glorious. When the graphical effects show, there is some slowdown, but JRPGs like this will be perfect for this device. In default settings, Gradius 5 runs fairly decent. But as more enemies enter the screen, and the background goes even crazier, it does slow down. Here's Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Unfortunately, it's so slow that I'd say it's unplayable. And the same goes for Tekken Tag Tournament. A ray of sunshine. We love Katamari Damacy. The intro plays perfectly, but the game does not.
would say it's better to find alternatives on the PSP. Many games were converted from the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3 to work with the PlayStation Portable, which runs pretty damn fabulous on this machine. The only real hiccup we had was with God of War, but that's fine, as no one plays this game anyway. If you do want to run this full speed, you can set it to one times resolution, but it'll let trash. The GTA games run without a hiccup, extremely decent on the Retro Pocket 3. If you wanted to play a version of Katamari Damashi, this is what to get, or we can remap the analog sticks to work like the PlayStation 2 counterpart. We can't forget the many versions of Metal Gear Solid. and outrun 2006 Coast to Coast runs great. That is, if you use my super secret settings. Don't tell anyone, it's a secret. It's a secret. If you're on manual stick, this is how you drift around corners. Turn in, shift down, shift up, then counter steer. Parappa the Rapper also had a version on the PSP, which uses the full 16-9 aspect ratio of our screen. And this is the time I found out there's a gyroscope in the handheld. Check this. If you have an emulator that supports this feature, you'll be able to use it. Next up is the Power Stone Collection. This is Power Stone 1 and 2 ported to the PSP with a widescreen. The Simpsons game is also running quite well. You may notice it says 20 FPS at the top, which matches the original game. And here's an excellent version of Space Invaders. Tekken 6 is also running very well. This game is always requested. You want to use the buffered settings and the OpenGL driver. If you've not checked any games from this series yet, I suggest you start with the first one, it's so good. And if you like Dungeon Keeper, you can't go wrong with this. On this machine, Wipeout Pulse looks fantastic. You want to choose Vulcan backend for this game. If you're looking for a good entry to the Metal Slug series, you really can't go wrong with Metal Slug Anthology. It has games from 1 to 6, as well as Metal Slug X.
The last PSP game we're going to test is Ridge Racer 2. This is a great entry point to the series and runs fabulous on our Retroid Pocket 3. We'll now move to the Sega set of consoles. Early systems such as the Master System, Mega Drive, 32X and even Sega CD run perfectly. We can't say the same for Sega Saturn. Much like the Nintendo 64, this is a system that is very difficult to emulate. It is very hit and miss. Even with the new version of Yaba Sanshiro 2, we can see that Sega Rally runs okay, but there are problems with the audio. Perhaps this can be fixed in a future update. We can have a better experience on the Dreamcast. We can use a variety of emulators, and for most of the time we're at 100% speed. We did have some dips in Marvel vs Capcom 2, quite obvious when we use a super move. But this could be solved by using Flycast. One thing we could not fix was Capcom vs SNK2. The one times resolution leaves us with graphical glitching. You can kind of fix it if you use half resolution, but that just looks terrible, and one and a half resolution slows it to about 40 frames per second. Next best thing we have is Capcom vs SNK on the Sega Naomi. Even though this uses very similar graphics, there is no glitching. We also tried the sequel for the Naomi, but same thing. Next up is King of Fighters 11. For the most part, Sega Atomus Wave runs pretty decent for this little handheld. Let's take a look at some Android apps. The touchscreen is pretty decent for this unit, but if we drag in from the side, we can bind our controls to the touchscreen. So we can assign the left stick down here, in my A button on the right, and we can play Slitherio with our controls. Here's another decent game called Lucky Boy. It's a really quirky puzzle game and I really enjoy it. As we have a small mic, we can use it as a guitar tuner, or if you have some friends, you could give them a call. If you're a pretty lady, you could also book an appointment at John Luke's Rub Down. We even have a delivery service. Next thing we're going to take a look at is Steam Link. If you have a PC capable of playing some games, we can stream the video output directly to our Retroid Pocket 3. And I'll tell you something, this works really well. We did some input latency tests, and as expected, it did not perform as well as the Ambenic 353P. As it uses the Android system, there is a lot more overhead compared to something like Linux. We also tested out the video output. We tried this on two TVs and my video capture card. If it's plugged in as you turn it on, we do get this screen. But outside that, nothing. That blow. It's time now to get to the pros and the cons. The Pocket 3 has a nice touchscreen display. With Android and Google Play, we have a lot of software at our disposal. We could be using Steam Link, but this thing is no slouch, especially for the price we paid for it. It feels decent in the hands, and the buttons are not too bad either. I thought I'd be hitting the home and the volume buttons, but that just wasn't the case. The main drawback is setting it up, and this could take hours, if not days. 
the micro HDMI just doesn't work and the input latency could be a turn off for the more serious players. At the end of the day, we feel that this is a solid improvement over the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. While it does lack character, the display alone opens up a world of possibilities, including the upscaled PSP. So, do you think that this handle is worth it? Or do you think Retroid are monkeying around? While we check out the attract mode of Aero Fighter 3, here's a quick thank you to all of those on our Patreon. It's with your support that we can continue with the Pandori project. We do video reviews, tutorials, as well as make the Pandori mod. This fixes and enhances the cheap Chinese arcades, and we also work on the A500 Mini. I told you it definitely is not Mini. Okay, why did you say that? She said it was cute. Okay. I'm going to the shop to buy a Kindle. Oh, okay, can you get me one too? No problem. Problem. Um. So, if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and subscribe. This has been Amy Chicken of Team Pandory, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra!